Welcome, everybody. I'm Henrika Altsink. I'm a professor in modern history here at the University of York, and I'm one of the co-directors of the Interdisciplinary Global Development Center, also at the University of York. Today's event is being sponsored by the York Maastricht Partnership. University of York and Maastricht University in the Netherlands have invested 3 million euros into a major strategic partnership that has led to nine dynamic research collaborations between the two institutions, as well as creative innovation, education opportunities for our students. We've just developed our plans for the future, which includes a major focus on research and teaching collaborations on the theme of sustainability. And indeed, our very first dual master's program in sustainable business launches this autumn. We're delighted, therefore, to hear more today about climate change, about conservation, and various other issues relating to sustainability. A few technical issues. If you are watching live, you can ask questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And this is available throughout the event. So whenever you have a question, just type away. Should there be any technical issues, such as you lose your Wi-Fi, then you can rejoin the event using the original link that you were sent. Please also remember that today's event is being recorded, so you can always watch again. Subtitles are available. Um, if you want to turn these on or if you want to turn them off, you can go at the bottom of your screen where it says CC live transcript and then you can use them or turn them off alternatively. So it gives me great pleasure now to introduce um, our keynote speaker today, Professor Raf de Bond. Professor uh, Raf de Bond holds the Chair of History of Science and the Environment at the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences at Maastricht University. He studied history at the University of Leuven in Belgium and at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in the US. In 2005, he took his doctoral degree with a thesis on the reception of evolution theory in Belgium. Before joining Maastricht, he was a postdoc at the University of Leuven and also a visiting fellow at Cambridge University and Imperial College London. Raf will be talking today about his new book, Nature's Diplomats, Science, Internationalism and Preservation from 1920 to 1960. And copies of this book will be available from our partner bookseller, Fock Lane Books. For more information on book sales, please look at our festival website or you can go directly to foxlanebooks.co.uk. So welcome then to Raf. Um, Raf will first give a presentation about his book then uh, myself and a colleague from York, who I'll introduce later on, will ask a few questions before we will take questions from you, the audience. So, Raf, over to you. Thanks so much uh, for this very uh, kind introduction. And thanks also very much, of course, to the organizers for uh, the opportunity to uh, talk a little bit about my book, uh, Nature's Diplomats. Uh, it's an actual thing, I've got it here. Uh, it's a physical object. Um, and basically, uh, this book, uh, as the title indicates, looks into the early history of uh, a type of conservation that um, presents itself as both international and scientific. Uh, and I got intrigued by uh, this, this particular constellation of an international science-based uh, nature conservation particularly um, because it has received a particular type of aura. Uh, it's generally seen as something that's uncontroversial, uh, that is inclusive, and that is not really an ideological thing at all. Right? And that has to do with its three components, with the fact that it's international, which means that everybody can take part, everybody can uh, contribute, that it's based in science, and science, of course, uh, also has this, this aura of being neutral, as, resorting to universal laws. And then finally, nature is often also seen as something that has little to do with the history of humans and their political conflicts. So it's seen as something that is timeless. Now, uh, when we look more closely uh, at, at conservation, of course, we see that it is highly political, uh, um, almost by definition, right? It's it's mobilizing particular groups, and these particular groups have particular interests. Um, it aims to protect particular natures, and it aims to do so in particular ways. Uh, and in my book, I try to understand 
all these uh, issues by looking at the historical roots of uh, international science-based conservation, uh, particularly looking at the early decades of the 20th century from the 1920s through the 1950s. And I look at the early networks of conservation, of international conservation, uh, how they define their objects of, of uh, conservation, and then finally, which instruments they developed in order to make this conservation work. Uh, and that's also what I'll touch very briefly upon in uh, this uh, presentation. Of course, uh, we can develop all kinds of aspects uh, later in the, in the Q&A. Um, so first, something about the networks. Who were the people who really came with this idea that, um, that conservation should be international, that it should be science-based? Um, I think... Um, there are a few societies, a few civic groups, which are um, particularly important, and those are also the ones that I discuss in my book. Um, and these are also the first uh, societies, the first committees that uh, put international in their actual name, in their, in their title. Um, so the first one was founded in London in 1922, the International Committee for Bird Preservation. And that's, of course, not a... Uh, a coincidence that the first society focused on birds, because of course, when you want to uh, preserve birds and particularly migratory birds, um, a national um, organization wouldn't do. Uh, you would have to protect them across borders. And that's what this uh, committee set out uh, to do. Uh, a year later, then in Berlin, another organization was uh, founded, the International Society for the Preservation of the European Bison which had to deal with a sort of similar problem. Um, the, the European bison by that point was almost extinct in the wild. And in order to save the bison, they had to collaborate between various zoos in different parts of the world. So also there it was rather uh, natural, so to say, to, to uh, work internationally. And then a, a third organization, which I uh, think is very important for this development, was set up in 1926. Uh, and that is called the International Office for Nature Protection, was situated in Brussels. Um, and this had a much broader ambition. This really wanted to protect nature as a whole uh, across the world. Uh, and uh, this uh, organization, like also the two others, still exists in a slightly different form. So after the Second World War, this became the International Union for the Protection of Nature, and that later changed its name in IUCN, International Union for the Conservation of Nature, uh, which is an organization that, that is still very active today. Um, when we look at the members of those three uh, organizations, what we see is that they are from particular parts of the world, right? Like this, as this map shows, uh, there's particular centers, um, notably in Europe and in uh, the, at the American East Coast. Uh, the most important centers actually being um, capital cities of uh, the European empires of the time, so London, Paris, Brussels, and Amsterdam. And uh, this is also of importance to understand some of the dynamics of this early uh, international uh, conservation. Uh, a second dimension I want to touch upon is the class background. When we look at uh, who, who those people were, we see that many of them, actually most of them, were at an upper class background, high bourgeoisie, many aristocrats as well. Um, and uh, when we look at gender, we see that most of them were men. Uh, and that also translates in a particular aura of conservation in the time period, a masculine aura. Uh, conservation was very much associated with adventure, with expeditions also with ideals of uh, what is, has been described as suffering for science. So just give one example. The man you see over here uh, is Carl Akeley, a taxidermist of the New York Natural History Museum. Um, and he's posing on this picture uh, after he's been uh, run over by an elephant and showing his injuries. Uh, on the right side, you see his grave, which is in the Albert National Park in the Belgian Congo, or was what used to be the Albert National Park, which is currently the Virunga Park, which is where he died also during an ex expedition. So you, you can see how this life of adventure, of danger, is associated with early uh, conservation um, practices. Um, 
In terms of their intellectual background, uh, it's important to see, say that many of them were trained in the natural sciences and um, a, a very important group of them had some link with natural history. Some of them uh, had a, a, profi a professional uh, link with natural history. They worked for natural history museums or for zoos. Others uh, were uh, amateur naturalists um, and they would have their own private natural history collections or also even private menageries. Uh, so as many of them were quite wealthy, uh, they could actually create their own personal zoo. So here you have one example, uh, Jean Delacour, probably the most uh, influential uh, French preservationist of the first half of the 20th century. You see here his uh, personal chateau, and you see also a part of his bird collection. Uh, he would bring in birds from his many expeditions from all over the world, uh, dead and alive, and he would have this huge natural history collection and uh, a private zoo, having amongst others birds in, in that zoo, but also an uh, important collection of uh, primates. Um, so, what I think is, is crucial for understanding this, these early uh, preservationists is that they very much sprang from a culture in which collecting and hunting were very central uh, activities. Um, what you see here is a, uh, or, or a series of pictures of really the, the leading figures uh, in, in my book. And uh, as you can see, all of them would engage in hunting in one way or the other, either to collect uh, sci uh, scientific specimens or uh, as a pastime, as a leisure uh, activity. Now, why, why is that important to understand their, um, their approach to conservation? I think in various ways. So um, people who make natural history collections tend to have a particular interest in things that are rare, right? Your collection becomes more, um, more interesting when it has rarities. Uh, and same goes partially for hunting as well. Um, and it is by looking for these rare uh, animals that uh, they also noticed that they became increasingly rare, right? And this, uh, and that some of them were actually threatened with extinction and this then became an incentive for protection. So it is through the activities of collecting and hunting that they were sensitized uh, to the plight of these, of these species. Okay, now can we still see some echoes of these networks uh, today? Right? We are a century later, uh, and of course, a lot of things have changed, right? And uh, I readily admit that also this conservation network did quite a lot to diversify um, their, their networks in, in, in various ways. Uh, but I think there are still some important echoes to be found in those networks. Uh, and also this, uh, or also these, these, or let's say that these early 20th century networks still resonate. Um, partially because this, the center of, let's say, the major uh, conservation organizations, the mainstream uh, uh, conservation organizations are still mostly, almost exclusively, I should say, in the global north. In their membership, we see a, a strong overrepresentation of uh, upper middle class people up until today. And we uh, continue to see an overrepresentation of men in leadership positions. Uh, furthermore, uh, we still see a strong dominance of the naturalist approach, of the, the natural sciences really dominate, rather than, for instance, uh, other approaches that come from the social sciences. Uh, and finally, there is also still a continued link with the zoos and natural history museums that were so important in the early decades of international conservation. And it's actually the exact same institutions, for instance, the Bronx Zoo in New York or the Natural History Museum in Paris that still are very uh, dominant players uh, today. So quite some continuities in uh, the networks of international conservation. Now, um, how about uh, the type of nature these people sought to protect? What is it they would focus on particularly? Um, once again, these people have to be situated in particular places, uh, in big cities, in uh, the global north. 
And the nature they sought out to protect was basically the nature that was uh, the opposite of the environment they would live in themselves, right? They were landscapes that represent the other in one way or, or, or the other. Um, landscapes that could be seen as primitive, and that meant untouched by human activity. Um, and these landscapes were often uh, seen as remnants of a distant past, right? The opposite of modernity, um, in a sense, prehistoric landscapes, if you will. Um, just as an example, these are two books written by uh, Mary Jope Akeley, that's the second wife of Carl Akeley, the man I showed you on one of the previous slides, who was run over by an elephant. And Mary Jope Akeley was quite active in lobbying for national parks in uh, the Belgian Congo. And she would uh, also describe these landscapes she hoped that could be protected in books like these, Congo Eden, where the wilderness lives again. Uh, and she would talk about uh, things such as the darkest Africa or the most primitive spot in all Africa or landscapes that are uh, Pleistocene landscapes, right? So they belong to another geological epoch. Um, so this, this already um, um, insinuates that for people like uh, Mary Jo Akeley, these landscapes were not only distant in a geographical sense, but also in a temporal sense, right? They were uh, remnants of a deep past that actually did not really belong in a modern uh, world. But therefore, they needed to be protected. Um, central in most of the activities of these early conservationists is that they focused on landscapes without humans, right? Uh, they um, wanted empty, virgin landscapes, uh, but they did make one exception, and that is hunter-gatherer populations. Uh, in various cases, they believed that these hunter-gatherer populations were actually part of the natural landscape, that they were in balance with the natural landscape, and that they even needed protection themselves because these hunter-gatherer uh, populations were uh, threatened, like indeed some uh, animal species or plant species might be threatened. Uh, here I have a quote once again from Mary Jo Akeley, in, in which she writes that in Congo, there is a unique opportunity of saving some of the primitive African pygmies, a race now threatened with extinction, right? So she uses exactly the same language for these hunter-gatherer populations as she would use for, um, I don't know, threatened gorillas, for instance. Um, when we, uh, there's another example uh, by the Dutch anthropologist uh, Belmer, who writes that uh, the, the conservation of these primitive cultures is essential for research. So he also uses an, um, an argument that was very often used for uh, the preservation of animals and plants, namely there is a scientific importance, we have to preserve them for science. This, the very same logic was used for the preservation of these uh, hunter-gatherer populations. Um, now I don't want to um, give the impression that the focus or the main focus of these organizations was uh, hunter-gatherer populations. Um, the main focus actually was uh, animals, definitely not plants, and a particular type of animals, so not all, not all animals. Um, in the literature, um, people often refer to charismatic animals as the object of conservation, and I think that's exactly what it is. Uh, it's particularly larger mammals and birds that became the center of attention of these early organizations. Uh, and of course, this ties in with uh, also this hunting and collecting tradition, right? So these mammals and birds were traditional objects of collection and hunting. Um, and within the groups of mammals and birds, there's also another particular focus, of course, on threatened species. Now, this might come as no surprise, right? This might seem self-evident, but maybe it is not so self-evident, right? You could have uh, uh, thought of preserving individual animals or of rather uh, preserving particular phenomena such as ecosystems or uh, migrations. Uh, but the fact that the focus is exactly on species and, and rare species in, in particular, I think has to do a lot with uh, the institutional settings that was important for early conservation, namely zoos and natural history museums, which were completely organized around taxonomic principles of species. So when you visit these, let's say, early 20th century natural history museum, you will see you go from one species 
to the next, right? And this is also how uh, early conservation was organized. What, what was seen as important is to save individual uh, species. That becomes the object of conservation action. Uh, and these uh, species of mammals and birds uh, also become the object of first red lists that are uh, initiated in this time period. Okay, so um, what are the echoes here? Um, has this changed a lot? Definitely, once again, the context has changed uh, uh, in, in quite some respect. Uh, of course, um, formal colonialism has come to an end in uh, most of the world. Uh, also, uh, increasingly, there's, there's the idea we live in the Anthropocene, where there is no longer a thing as untouched nature. All nature is, in one way or the other, influenced by humans, by climate change, for instance. Um, but what uh, we do see is, and, 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 what, and what we see is that uh, there have been attempts to uh, broaden the attention within uh, the conservation organizations. Uh, to include, for instance, other taxonomic groups, uh, to refocus from species to uh, ecosystems, and also to rethink uh, their relation with hunter-gatherers, which are uh, increasingly uh, presented as partners, no longer as, as objects of protection. Yet, uh, also here, I think there are some important echoes of the past. When you look at campaigns of um, mainstream conservation organizations, such as the World Wildlife Fund, what you see is that there's still a strong focus on charismatic mammals and birds, and they are then represented as keystone species, and by saving them, the idea is you save the ecosystem. But the, the focus on this particular number of species, gorillas, rhinos, uh, tigers, has remained more or less the same uh, as it was in the early 20th century. We see that botanists are often quite unhappy with the focus of uh, uh, conservation. They say that much of conservation is plant blind. There's very little attention for uh, the preservation of uh, plant species. Uh, and also that is a continuation of uh, existing folk life of the, the early 20th century. And then finally, uh, I think also stereotypes of uh, uh, hunter-gatherer groups persist in some ways, in the sense that they are still often represented as what people have called ecologically noble savages, pe people who are frozen in time and in, in a sort of balance with uh, nature, that they are, in a sense, still represented as part of the uh, ecosystem. Okay, now the final uh, aspect that I would want to touch very briefly upon is the, the type of instruments these early groups, these early conservationist groups, uh, try to develop in order to preserve uh, nature. And basically there's three that are uh, very important for them. The first one is protected areas, uh, national parks and, and reserves. Now, of course, they have not been invented in the 20th century. They can be traced back to a very long tradition. Um, medieval tradition even of, of aristocratic estates and hunting reserved, but they are transformed in important ways in the 20th century, particularly in the colonial context. Um, what we see is that many of these national parks, for instance in sub-Saharan Africa, are represented as being global laboratories for research, places where you can still find a true wilderness, um, and this then is often used to legitimize also the eviction of local populations, of indigenous populations from these uh, protected areas uh, because they would interfere with the natural balance and then it would no longer be a, a laboratory for research. Um, a second instrument that um, becomes increasingly important in the early 20th century are international conventions. Uh, there's a whole series of those. One very influential one was the Convention uh, of London of 1933, protecting fauna in, in Africa. And when you look at the negotiations uh, behind the scenes of those conventions, what we see is that the people from the, the organizations that I uh, talked about, that they play a very influential role. And the way they manage to play such an influential role is because they uh, put on various hats, right? They, they play a triple role. On the one hand, they are consulted as experts, experts about nature, about the state of nature in Africa. 
But of course, there are also lobbyists lobbying for a particular type of solution, national parks, for instance. And then thirdly, they often also play the role of diplomats representing a particular country. So for instance, in London, you would have uh, somebody representing Belgium, somebody representing the UK, uh, and all these people would come from uh, um, various um, uh, from from these various organizations that, that I mentioned. Uh, and then the third instrument uh, that was initiated, was developed in the early 20th century is uh, that of the stud book. Um, and you see an example from such a stud book here. Um, basically what stud books do is they bring together data on uh, animals that are held in, in captivity uh, in order to breed them uh, in more successful in successful ways. And the end goal was to reintroduce uh, threatened animals in the wild. Um, and um, through, those, through those step books, the first one was one for the, for the uh, European bison. Um, through those step books, uh, the whole exchange of animals uh, was, was regulated, was organized. Uh, with a particular attention for uh, the heredity, uh, for, the, for the genetic background of those animals. Uh, and so what you see is that the focus becomes, uh, is, is very much on, on those genes, right, on the, uh, uh, the hereditary traits of those animals, and they become completely detached from their uh, original uh, habitat. And the focus really is on the individual animals and uh, on their uh, genes. Okay. Now, uh, what uh, are the sort of long-term echoes here? Uh, so once again, uh, the context has changed, but I think uh, international conservation relies even more than in the early 20th century on these three uh, instruments of conservation. So the global surface of protected areas has increased quite a lot, uh, particularly since the 1980s. On the slide you see in green, an overview of uh, the protected areas around the world uh, today. I think it's from 2017, actually, uh, but at least the, the recent state of affairs. Um, and what we also see, and that's also uh, in a, way a sad echo from the past, is that in several places across the world, there's also continued evictions, some of them associated with a type of conservation that critics have described as fortress conservation, in which um, a particular area is um, fenced off and defended as if it were a fortress uh, and, and all um, surrounding uh, people, surrounding populations are, are kept out as much as, as, much as possible. Um, what we also see is that the number of global conventions relating on environmental issues has dramatically increased when we compare to the early 20th century, particularly since the 1970s, there's a whole series of global um, of global conventions on wildlife trade, for instance. Uh, so also this instrument has, has gained importance. And then finally, uh, also captive breeding and reintroduction projects have further expanded, particularly since the uh, period around 2000, uh, thanks to new uh, technologies in breeding. These breeding uh, schemes have become more successful. Uh, and this also has made that conservation has become more interventionist, that there's more, um, um, animals caught in the wild and bred in captivity and then brought back uh, to uh, their wild habitats. Okay, so um, just some very, very general conclusions. Uh, I think um, there is a lot that has changed, right? And then I don't have time to dwell upon all those uh, aspects. I think within conservation, quite some effort has been done to adapt to the times. But I, I also think that there are important continuities to be seen in the networks of conservation, of international conservation, in the type of nature they seek to preserve and in the instruments they use to preserve this nature. Uh, so there is a certain path dependency here in the sense that the uh, social cultural context of early international conservation of the period of the 1920s and 1930s still has an impact on uh, the way we think about conservation today. 
Uh, and this is one of the reasons for me to, to write this book. And I partially and maybe mostly written it out of a historical interest in this particular phenomenon. I wanted to understand the early 20th century, but I think it can also tell us something for today. I think history can show us that things could have been different if other choices had been made in the 1920s and 1930s. And in that sense, I hope that it can also uh, help us to think how to escape maybe some of the constrictions uh, of the past. Okay, uh, I'm going to leave it here. Uh, and I'm happy to uh, hear your uh, questions. Thank you for um, what was a really whistle-stop tour of the book and I hope that people um, have enjoyed it as much reading as, as you know hopefully they will buy the book and enjoy it as much as I did when, when reading your book. As mentioned at the beginning of, of this session the book can be purchased from our supplier and there's more information on, on the festival website as well. I would like to introduce now my colleague Dr Hannah Cotton. Dr. Hannah Cotton is a postdoctoral researcher in the Department of History at York. She holds a PhD from uh, Ghent University in Belgium with a study on 19th century land reforms in the highland of Bolivia. At York, she works on a project on the Colombian Paramo, that's a tropical montane region, where she maps socio-ecological change over the last 200 years, focusing particularly on human nature interactions, and, and the issue of conservation is quite key to that project. So Hannah and I will ask uh, Raf a few questions. Uh, Raf has been very kind of sharing his book with us um, because it's only literally just come out. So we'll ask him a few questions and then we'll take questions from the public. And I see there's already a lot of you with very good questions, but keep um, coming and, and, and enter more in the Q&A. So Hannah, over to you. Thank you, uh, Henrike, and well, thank you, Raf, for, um, uh, well, for your book in the first place, but also for this, uh, this presentation, I, I think. Your presentation really demonstrates um, or, or really is an invitation to reflect further on the, the interconnected history, present and, and future of, of conservation. And, and my first question is, is about the role of sources maybe in that reflection or in that, that exercise. You, you describe in, in the book, but also present in the presentation, how what initially is something very heterogeneous, how we, how, how we know, so to say, nature, how we relate to nature and how in this early stage of, of international nature protection, this, this became subject to a process of institutionalization what, and, and also what you term scientification, how this kind of narrowed this diversity to one single possible or legitimate way of knowing nature, of relating to nature. My question is, if, if, well, if you could expand maybe more, a bit more, tell us a bit more about um, the sources you have used to unearth this, this diversity or how this diversity of these different knowledges and interests that they were, were silenced, were streamlined um, in, in that early phase or from that early phase on, how that process was made, maybe also resisted or, 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 or successful or not. So how, how, which sources you used, how they've helped you to alert that and, and in link to that, um, what in your view is the potential uh, and maybe also the limits of historical source material to inform um, this contemporary ongoing rethinking of, of conservation uh, in, a, in a more pluralistic way, so to say. Okay, uh, thanks Anna, that's a very interesting uh, set of questions. Uh, maybe let me start by the source material, right? So um, indeed, um, I think when you're interested in, let's say, um, more heterogeneous uh, dimensions of early conservation, um, it's not sufficient to look into published source material. Right? So you have, for instance, these conference proceedings, um, because when you are um, a particular movement, um, you want to streamline your message, right? You want to speak in one voice because of course that's, that's more convincing. Uh, you don't want to show internal division. Uh, so if you want to look behind, let's say the public face, um, Stephen Hillgardner, who's a, who's a historian of science, uh, calls this a front stage, right? Uh, so this is a, the public image uh, these organizations have. Um, and he argues in order that we have to enter the backstage. Uh, and, and one way to do that is to read things that are not published. So archival materials, uh, this can be, uh, for 
instance, meeting reports, but also a source that I use a lot is letters uh, because people are much more uh, open <laughs> about all kinds of conflicts or, or disagreements or different visions in, in letter writing. Uh, I can give one example, for instance, um, what you had in bird protection uh, in, in the early period of the 20th century, or you, you have that sort of older tradition in the 19th century, which involved quite a lot of women, in, um, particularly in the UK, against wearing feathered hats. Uh, and they uh, often made very strong moral points uh, about also about animal welfare. Uh, and um, within the group, when it becomes more uh, focused on natural history, we see that these uh, opinions are sidelined, right? And also in letters, you see, okay, we don't invite this particular person because she will come once again with her sentimental uh, arguments, right? So uh, this is then deemed sentimental, whereas the other is seen as rational, right? So that's a type of thing you won't sense from the published material what you do find in, in the sources. And then to, to answer the second part of your question, how, how this can help maybe in pluralizing or bring back or rethink conservation in a more plural way. Um, I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> I don't think it will solve all problems. Uh, but what it may be contribute to a little bit is that it shows in, in a sense the political dimension of all those things, right? Uh, it's, it repoliticizes re the discussion. So, of course, a lot of effort went in to show, to giving the impression, okay, this is, there's just one way to look at, at the problem. And by showing the disagreements, you can at least show, okay, there, there might be various visions, there might be uh, various ways to approach this issue. Uh, and we might have an open discussion about it, right? And people might have different values and those might be discussed. Uh, and so I think that could be a potential uh, contribution. Thank you. So in, in, in your, the three parts of your presentation, at the end, you always show what's the resonance, the echoes with the present. And, and you really, in the epilogue of the book, you really spell out all those resonances. And, and in the epilogue, you say that these international organizations like the WF and so on, that they are neo-colonial. So they may have a board and a council that includes you know, non-European members, but they are still marked by unequal relations between global north and between global south. So I was, was hoping if you could expand a bit upon that. So for example, you mentioned as well that you know, still there is a lot of conventions being, you know, like another echo is these conventions. So what voice do uh, low middle income countries have in like the drafting of those? And, and maybe say a bit more about why you, you use that word neo-colonial. Yeah, yeah, maybe uh, as a, as a uh, because it, yeah, it, there's a lot in this question. So maybe uh, I, I don't actually think I use the term neo-colonial. <laughs> uh, although I, I would be happy to say that there is uh, echoes of colonialism. Uh, but there's also a particular reason why I, I'm a bit uneasy with the term neo-colonial in the sense that, um, of course, it's a very uh, loaded term. Uh, and I think we shut down the conversation with conservationists when using it. But apart from the strategic reason, I also think that uh, formal colonialism is still something different from what we see today. Um, so that being said, I think there are um, some tensions that persist. And I think particularly in these mainstream, these large international conservation organizations, uh, in the sense that um, their um, headquarters are in the north and their the nature they seek to protect is in the, in the global south. And so the, also the, the people who have to live with the policies that are developed in the global north are mostly people in the global south. So I think that this asymmetry, which is of course an asymmetry present very much in the, in the colonial context has not completely disappeared. Um, I think with conventions, there's might maybe a slightly different dynamic in the sense that um, many of those are negotiated by uh, representatives of countries. And of course, as a country, you also have the possibility to opt out or to uh, renegotiate or, so in that sense, I think there's maybe a little bit more um, maneuvering space for uh, representatives of the global south. Um, but I think in, in 
um, you, you see something similar uh, also in present day discussions about climate change, right? Who is uh, who is responsible, uh, who takes the lead in finding the solutions. Um, and um, I think uh, what you see in, um, for instance, intergovernmental organizations like UNESCO or, or uh, UN organizations, there there has been much more change because there we work with government representatives, right? And then we have representatives of all these newly independent countries in the 1960s and 1970s. But in NGOs, this has not really happened to the same extent because, uh, yeah, those are private organizations uh, and you don't automatically have uh, representatives of those countries. Many of those, once again, have tried, but those imbalances and those asymmetries certainly persist in, in, in various organizations and particularly in the big ones. Okay, so I think what I want to do is take a few questions from, from the public. And two, two of our um, audience members, they've asked for your opinion on whether there is a, still a place for the zoo in modern day conservation. Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Uh, and uh, I'm a bit ambivalent myself there, uh, I must say. Um, I think, um, so, um, I guess there's, so the argument that in, in favor of zoos that's often been used, and that's also an argument that goes back to the early 20th century, is there's basically two types of tasks they can fulfill. One is they can play an educational role, right, in, in telling large audiences about conservation. And given that there are uh, hundreds, thousands of zoos, they potentially can reach mass audiences. The second argument that's been used is that um, several species would have gone extinct if it weren't for zoos, right? Uh, the European bison being one, right? Now, now there's quite a lot of those animals in the wild, in the semi-wild again, but there were 50 left in the early 20th century. And there's a few other of those examples. Now, the critics will argue, and I also feel for their criticism, <laughs> I think their criticism is also sound, they will say, well, um, you could do education without uh, captive animals, and probably you could do conservation um, without having public zoos. You might have some breeding programs very targeted for some particular species, but you don't need all those um, I don't know, very fairly common animals uh, in zoos um, because they're, they're not used for conservation, right? The great majority of animals in zoos have nothing to do with conservation. They're there for uh, public display, but not so much for. So I think there's something to be, to be said for both arguments. Uh, and I'm, uh, yeah, I, I think um, zoos could be retaught in various ways uh, and, and probably be more targeted uh, towards conservation, um, but I would be hesitant to say that we should get rid of them all. Uh. And, and I think another related question is a bit about, um, you know, the, the continued emphasis on these iconic or charismatic species. And, and one of our um, attendees um, picked up that you suggested that we should focus away from that but but what should we focus on instead then if we don't focus on these you know the tigers that you know wwf wants us to rescue and what have you what should you know modern day conservation be focused on yes uh well i um i think one of one one of the problems i think with with uh this exclusive focus on spectacular wildlife far away is that it um, um, makes that, um, yeah, there's very little daily connection with those, with those animals, right? So I can be uh, very um, concerned about tigers, but I will never meet a tiger, right? And uh, probably um, it's, it's more useful to, to develop tiger conservation with people who, live in the area where there is actually tigers. Uh, and there might be all kinds of small scale nature in our direct surroundings that we can contribute to, to preserve, which is maybe slightly less spectacular. 
but uh, what is spectacular and what is charismatic is of course also partially a cultural construction. So if you do the work in, in making this uh, nature more uh, attractive in uh, showing why it is important uh, and why it's wonderful in various ways, I think you can also change ideas. And I think there, there's, there's some conservationists who say that, that this can't be done, that there's almost a sort of natural reflex when we see a tiger, we are, uh, it's, we are automatically convinced that, that this should be saved, that it's, a, it's almost an evolutionary reflex. But I don't think that's true. Um, so one example I would like to give is the European hamster, which is a small rodent, which lives in the Netherlands. In the 19th century, this was seen as a pest. Right? We should kill it. Uh, we should exterminate it. We should get rid of it. And all representations were highly, highly negative. Uh, and in the late 20th century, this has been turned around completely. And now it's seen as a cherished symbol of the countryside, etc. And there's a lot of money going for conservation. And so you can see how you can turn around the image of this particular animal or a particular landscape or a particular plant if you are willing to, to invest in it, I think. Um, Hannah, do you have any further questions for Raf? While other people still gather their ta ta thoughts, please put them in the Q&A, but Hannah. Yes, yes, I, I, I actually have a question that relates to um, the notion of laboratory, which is um, a notion that pops up quite frequently in the book and that you indicated it. I think you also can pinpoint, I think, also some of the um, uh, elements that you pointed out in the, in the presentation now. Uh, but you show that it, it, it really featured as a key trope in the dominant discourses that supported um, the international project of nature uh, protection. And you, you, in your book, you have, you have a, a chapter on uh, the Albert National Park as an, and the park itself as a laboratory. Um, and and it, 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 yeah, you show that, that it both plays out metaphorically as um, in, in claims about um, uh, producing universal truth, uh, producing uh, development, but also it also had very concrete physical um, effects or, or, or consequences in the way things were, the landscape um, was reorganized. So I, I wanted to ask if you could um, tell us a bit more about these, the role of laboratory and the concrete, both intended, but also maybe non-intended effect that um, that laboratory as a discourse and a practice had in in, uh, in nature uh, protection. Yes, yeah, uh, yeah thanks, Hannah. Um, so I think, um, so the, the term laboratory was used by the, by the people I, I described. And I think they uh, use it strategically in two ways. So one is um, conservation science was, is, a, is a field science. And uh, field science generally is less prestige than laboratory science, right? So if you could claim that you also had a kind of a laboratory, right? And that maybe your laboratory was even a better laboratory because it's, they made the arguments to the actual physical laboratory is artificial nature, but we, our laboratory is actual nature. It's real nature, it's unspoiled nature. Uh, that, so that there is a, a strategic benefit in claiming that you also have a laboratory, right? So that your work is also prestigious in this, in this particular way. Um, and then secondly, I think the notion of laboratory comes with the idea of control. Uh, you control the, the particular equipment you have in your laboratory. And also historians of science who worked on the history of laboratories have shown how access is very much regulated in laboratories. And so not everybody can enter a laboratory. It's basically only the, the scientists who can enter. And I think that's also more or less what you see in the National Park, right? So that was also very much a rationale. They believed uh, the National Park should be there for science and it should be pure nature, uh, which means uh, people who traditionally use this for hunting or for harvesting bamboo or so, they could no longer enter because then they would interfere with unspoiled nature. But it also meant that um, tourists actually were not that welcome, right? Because also they would interfere. Uh, now there was a bit more lobby for the tourists than there was for the indigenous populations. Uh, so they reached a bit of a compromise there. But I think much of what they try to do is to organize it as a place in which only scientists can enter to keep it as a, in its virgin state, right? Without human uh, interference. 
it is also this went very far, right? So, for instance, uh, traditionally uh, there were quite a lot of fires in the Albert National Park uh, because uh, yeah, the, the local population set parts on fire. But this was relatively important to keep it an open landscape, and also particular animals were adapted to this, right? Uh, but the park administration stopped doing that because they saw that as interfering with the natural state. So you would see that the, the all kinds of plants started growing. Uh, some some animals disappeared from the park, right, because of this this particular policy. So you can see how this laboratory is, is more. And I'm happy you uh, picked up on that. It's more than just a discourse, right? It's actually a thing that's translated into a physical reality, uh, and in in a particular way of managing uh, a space. Uh, and I think the main goal is to shield it off from particular people and to uh, have other people from all over the world in that sense, American scientists, Japanese scientists, Swiss scientists, uh, get them to the park. So that was a sort of the, the underlying idea. So there are two um, um, questions from the audience that really link in uh, quite closely to, to your answer just. And that is indeed about, about this, the protected areas and, and you know, the, the separation of, of humans away from that. And um, particularly, I think one of them um, ties in with the map that you've shown of the increase in protected areas and that you said, you know, there's a lot of people who have been relocated as a result. So one question is more about then, if you have areas that are protected, but because of climate change, the areas next to it um, becomes, you know, not usable anymore for agriculture, for example, or hunting or whatever, um, should people be allowed in and, and make use of the protected areas? And another one is whether you know of any examples where indigenous communities have been forced to move away when a new protected area was set up, whether any have been allowed back in? Yes. Uh, okay, those are two good questions. Um, let me start with the second one. I do think there are examples, right? So there have been um, court cases right, in, in various countries where people challenged the evictions and uh, more often than not, those were won either by the government or by the, the people who did the relocation. But in some cases, uh, decisions were overturned. Uh, actually, the, the example I described in the book, the Albert National Park, uh, you can see that it was a bit of a, um, a power play in which power shifted from time to time. So in the early days, in the 1920s, 1930s, there was a very um, strong support for the conservationists on the, on the uh, governmental level. But it shifted during the Second World War when people wanted to also to win over the indigenous population. And uh, at that point, the borders were redrawn of the park and, and people were allowed, for instance, to fish again in the park, etc. Uh, so it, it really also depends on the local dynamics. Uh, and it's certainly not a one way street. Uh, uh, the question on uh, climate change and whether sh they should be allowed back in. Yeah, that's, of course, a, a moral question. And I think that's also a very complex dependent uh, question. Um, but I think, yeah, maybe they, they should not have been evicted in the first place, or there, there should have been uh, other types of solutions. Um, what you do see is that in various places, uh, conflicts are increasing connected with, with climate change, right? Because there is less uh, arable land, for instance. Uh, so in, in, in some areas, we see that tensions, tensions arise. and, and um, but then, of course, there's all kinds of uh, things that need to be taken into account, right? I think the people who make a claim that, I don't know, take, for instance, Virunga National Park. So this is one of the only places with uh, mountain gorillas, right? So if you say, okay, we stop the whole idea of the park, and it's in a highly populated area surrounding the park. So it's a, it's a very uh, tense and, and, and complicated situation. I think if you would abolish the park, you would, lose the, you would definitely lose the gorillas. Um, so I, I think, um, yeah, there, there's definitely uh, the, the people in, in the area should be taken more into account. I'm, I'm, I'm certainly convinced of that, but then of course there's probably various ways to do so. Uh, so one size fit all ex um, solution to say, okay, let's abolish the parks. <laughs> uh, I, wouldn't be, I wouldn't be in favor uh, of that. 
Um, but I do think that uh, there should be uh, definitely much more. Um, and in some, in some countries and some places do that, right? They, they do have more participation of local communities in how uh, parks are run, uh, in decisions that are being made about those parks. Uh, but certainly, that's certainly not the rule. So in, in most places, it's very much a top down. I think we are running out of time. Uh, we could go on and on because there are indeed, you know, your 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 history from the 20s till the 60s. Um, as you say, there's so many resonance with the present, and then automatically that leads to questions: Where should conservation practice be going to keep in, you know, to make it inclusive? As you say, when you talked about the the protected areas, how it takes local communities into account. So I really want to thank Raf for um, a really excellent whistle-stop tour of his, his new book and for Hannah for insightful questions and for you the audience as well. Please note that a recording of this event um, will be available on the festival's YouTube channel and that can be accessed from the watch again section of the festival website um, and that will be available there after the 20th of June. Um, and if you signed on for this event you'll get an email saying when it will be available uh, to view as a, as a video. So we very much hope that you'll continue to be engaged with the York Festival of Ideas. Um, please go to our website. Um, it's on, on, on your screen there with um, details of all the events that will be coming up. And of course, we also love to hear your thoughts on our events and to continue conversation with us using a hashtag at York Ideas. And then I think what remains me to say uh, for me to say now is to thank you all for attending. And we very much hope um, to see you back at one of our other sustainability events. That's on Thursday, the 17th of June at one o'clock. Um, the theme of that session is green growth and community wealth connection. Um, an expert panel then will reveal how a green recovery could create millions of jobs, promote our health and well-being, and lead us to a fairer and more resilient future. So thank you all so much and goodbye. <laughs>